Um, we just want Cyrus. Cyrus, you just uh, we are really grateful that you are able to eventually join. We're going to be having a post to ID now. Now, if you can just unmute yourself, show us your face, and just say hi in one minute, Cyrus. If you can hear me, unmute, unmute the main one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cyrus, can you hear us? Um, sir, can you hear us, sir? Hello? Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, just say hi to us. Okay. There's been a time muddle in the time zone, so um, my humblest apologies. It looks like you have missed, or I have missed this, the timing of the session. Uh, so, good morning to you all. Um, I trust that you have been able to still experience the favor of God and all that's going on there, seeing in our uh, humanity, God still pours out his grace into earthen vessels. And uh, I am, I have to depend on that every day. And this is one of those days. And I trust that you are receiving his, his kind graciousness in the middle of all that's going on at your end. I'm sure um, there'll be things to have be worked through. So my humblest apologies, I got that wrong. And I request for your forgiveness in this regard. No worries, immediately after Apostle Adil, I want you to be coming in. Yeah, sir, sir, we will want to have you now, if you cannot mute, so that you can say hi to the people and go into the session, sir. Well, um, I've told you so much about Apostle Adil Awar. He was my pastor, my spiritual father. I got born again under him. In those days, he was pastoring our church, the 13,000 church in Ibadan. When I joined the church, I just noticed people would be running. We used to have one, two sessions of Bible study. The Bible study was the main thing. It was on TV. And uh, we used to run. I would just come down from the uh, but, and I'll see people running. Why are they running? They're running to Bible study. And in 1988, it was teaching from the book of Leviticus. Uh, I remember the title of the teaching was Hearing and Getting Something. That night I got born again. Well, um, I eventually joined in when I graduated in full stature missions international, briefly before I left Ibama. When you know a little, just like I've been advertising, so without wasting time, join me this morning as I welcome Apostle I.D. Flower. So I'll go to you. You are muted, sir. Your mic is muted. What? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear, sir. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear 
Hello? Hello, sir. We can hear you. Hello? Hello? You can hear me. You can hear me. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay, can I start now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry? Good, you can start. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to greet everybody in this uh, meeting and give praise to the Lord God Almighty uh, for making today possible and uh, for helping the, uh, the beautiful place, parish, uh, to organize this uh, beautiful meeting again this year. I want to glorify God for uh, the brethren, uh, the elders of the church, as well as the pastor and his wife, uh, Brother Charles and the Sister Nick. God bless you for your efforts for world evangelization and reaching out across the globe. Uh, for this uh, invitation and uh, believe that God will use it to bless a lot of people at this time. Um, I've been following you now for more than two hours, <laughs> and uh, but sometimes we'll be disconnected um, from the uh, line, but uh, I believe that God will make things stable within this one hour uh, by the grace of the living God. Amen. I also want to greet my engineers who are here. There are two engineers with me here uh, trying to make things possible. <laughs> so the Lord bless you all. Um, I want to pray now. Father, because of your mercy, and I want to thank you for calling us, uh, making us able uh, to do this work and to join forces together across the globe and make the word of God that goes thank you for those who are hearing me. Lord, I pray that my tongue will be understandable and my pronunciation will be acceptable and uh, learn from even as I speak, even to the brethren and all who listen to me this hour. Blessed be your name, O Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray Amen. Amen. Um, I'm trying to understand uh, the topic that I was giving. So the way I phrased it is understanding the apostolic ministry. Uh, one, the manifestation, understanding of the apostolic ministry, and the manifestations and operations. Uh, that's the way I can title uh, my message. Uh, this is indeed an interesting topic. Uh, coming at this last time because the days have run very far and our generation today and the generation are beneficiaries of long-term work by many, many elders and fathers who have gone before us. Therefore, we have ancient wisdom from our fathers to be able to manifest in these last days. So I want to ask you to please pay attention uh, to some of the revelations that God might give us. Now, let me say that there is a foundation for all ministry, Christianity itself and all that we do, that it is all by faith. There is a foundation for all ministry, for all Christianity and all that we do in Christ, and it is called faith. I want to particularly appeal to you to understand that the time which we are now is a season called the Passover. According to Exodus chapter 12, verse 11, that's where that word first comes up in the Bible. And it's called the Passover. And the Passover in the Hebrew tongue is Pesach. Uh, Pesach. And those are two words that are combined into two. The first part is pay. P-E-H, and the second part is sec, and that is S-A-K-H. Now, P means the mouth. 
that is the mouth with which we speak. The second part means talking. And therefore, when you put the two together, you come to the two words, talking mouth, or mouth that is talking, a talking mouth. That, that's very, very important when we think about the Passover. And that is also very important in the revelation and the inspiration of the scriptures that is given to us, and it's very, very powerful that we understand how the Bible and they receive the glimpse of this apostolic writing. For example, in Romans chapter number 10, we learn something there that is very, very important and uh, very, very instructive. And that is why we get to know that the Lord wants us to make sure that we understand all that we do in the faith. For example, when I mention Romans chapter number 10, I want to read to you in Romans chapter 10, in verse 9 and 10, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And then he verses unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you see here that salvation is basic and salvation is received by believing with the heart and then confessing with the mouth. So the talking mouth, which is the Pesach, which is the Passover, uh, there is actually nothing like Easter in the Bible. Uh, in the Bible, you have the word Passover. Even in the Acts of the Apostles, where they wrote Easter, if you look at the Greek that is there, you find that it is Passover uh, that is there, not uh, Easter. Uh, but I think those days there were some uh, um, you know, etymological issues around the world, Easter being synonymous with Easter, which is an idol worship word. Uh, but let's not bother ourselves about that right now. What is important is the word Passover. And that word Passover is so important for us that it talks about the talking mouth in the Hebrew. And so when we have the talking mouth, and then the Bible says here that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now that's very powerful, that we believe with the heart and confess with our mouth. So again, the talking mouth comes here very prominently. And the Bible also says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so if faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God in verse 17 of chapter 10, then we know that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hearing by the word of God. The word of God can come by the mouth. The word of God only come by the mouth. So hearing is when we speak. When we speak, then somebody else hears. And therefore, he is able to pick up the word of God that is being spoken. So this is a season, a 10-year season, a 10-year period, prophetically known as the Passover season from 2020 to 2030. That's a period of Passover, generally. And so we know definitely that God is speaking to his people. And I believe that is why we are holding this meeting. So apart from the fact that the talking mouth is involved in salvation, it is also basically the same in receiving from God on any other issue. Every need as well is received by faith. So I want you to see that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So for you, as you listen to me today, and to receive maximally, from this program and from this word of God, I want you to notice that God and hearing by the word of God, as it is written also uh, in the word of God, as I know, in my speaks there, if thou canst believe, all things are possible. So we know that all things are possible to him that believeth. And that's what Jesus spoke concerning, the, uh, concerning us. So if you are going to 
participate and benefit in the things of God and the word of God, even as you hear me this very, this very moment. I want you to understand that faith only comes by the word of God. It comes by hearing what I'm talking about this particular night. And I believe uh, for me here it is night, and I know for you it is a day. Uh, but I want you to understand this clearly, that God is interested that we be very, very active in hearing. And when we hear, then we are able to make sure that we juxtapose what we hear uh, by faith. And so the hearing of faith removes doubt. The hearing of faith removes anything called doubt from our hearts. And that makes, us, makes it easy for us to receive from God. And so let me again make sure that uh, you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, because it's so vital in verse 23 of Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. I repeat again, Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straight away the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And so you see right there that Jesus expects people who listen to him who is an apostle himself, that the way you receive from an apostle is to believe what the apostle is saying. And then you begin to receive what is being spoken. I want to refer again to Acts, uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, is also a key verse. Acts chapter 14, verse 8 to 10. Acts of 14, verse 8 to 10. It says, And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled. And I want to be patient. You want me to be, you want to be patient with me here. Because there was a man uh, right there in the place where he was speaking to be healed. And then Paul shouted and said, you know, arise on your feet on in verse number six. Uh, so let's say that somebody is listening to you, but will perceive by the discerning of spirits that he is ready to receive what you are saying. Then you shout it out so that the person can receive the word of God. So I want you to understand that even Paul the apostle, when he spoke, we are told very clearly that a man who was lame was listening to him and he had him and suddenly the man jumped on his feet and he was able to walk. So you can draw from the faith or you can draw by faith from what you are hearing. And so I want you to draw by faith. That's where I'm going eventually. I'm settling on that fact that as you are listening, as you are seeing, that you believe the word of God and that you make that to be riveted and tied to your mind and you let your body as well as your mind as well as your spirit cling to the word of God. When it is like that, there is nothing you ask for at that moment. When those things line up that you will not receive. And so in talking about the apostolic ministry, I want to be very, very clear as I try to bring the points to you the way that God has shown me and taught me over the years. Now, there's what we call spiritual gifts, all right? There are spiritual gifts. There are nine spiritual gifts. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the discerning of spirits, the gift of faith, the working of miracles, all right? And tongues and interpretation of tongues. We have these nine gifts of the spirit. They are different from the gifts of men. They are different from ministry gifts. Ministry gifts are the prominent ones among the ministry gifts are those of the pastor, the evangelist, the teacher, the prophet, and then the apostle. These are five major gifts in the church, but they are ministry gifts and we call them the gifts of men. In other words, God has to raise somebody like you to be a gift to the beautiful uh, place church. You have to be a, a person that is settled in that church. And then you begin to become part of that church, wedded into that church, 
that you know as a living stone in that church and you are grounded in that church and you are settled in that church and then god begins to call you uh, to be a part of that body and to be a gift to that body in other words when you are a gift to the body the local body you begin to see the manifestation of the gifts of the spirit in your life and that helps you to be able to manifest as well as to be useful in the body of christ let me recap what i've said thus far number one it takes faith to receive anything from god that's why i talk, told you that this season we are in this season of time in 2023 and even the the the, the, the passover period we are in now is a time that the bible speaks about pay and sick, and which means the talking mouth. In other words, if our mouth is speaking, you are able to hear, and then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Secondly, I told you that the ministry gifts of the word of wisdom, of the word of knowledge, of the discerning of spirits, of the gifts of faith, of the working of miracles, and the gifts, plural, of healings, plural, and the, the gift of, of prophecy, all right, that's the gift of exhortation and, and comfort. Those gifts, as well as tongues and interpretation, they are spiritual gifts. They are gifts from the Holy Spirit. But then when these spirit gifts of the Holy Spirit are combined together in certain forms, then they are able to go into operation in the life of men. And so that accumulates in the life of human beings who are members of the body of Christ, and then we call those men the gifts ministry. In other words, they are men who are gifts to the local church. They are men who are gifts in the, to the church in the nation. And they are men who are gifts internationally uh, by the grace of God, depending on the, the level of the grace that God bestows on each person. He is able to exercise this gift uh, on regional level, on local level, on state level, on national level, on international level. And so we know that to be a fact from experience uh, of many of the brethren that I have worked with. So the gifts after the Lord Jesus Christ must be something that you are able to embrace because these are gifts that Jesus gave after he rose from the dead the gifts of men and that's why the bible says in ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 the very first phrase in that and that scripture says he gave unto men he gave some he gave some so it's a gift he gave some to be apostles he gave some to be prophets he gave some to be teachers he gave some to be pastors and evangelists so he gave men to the church after the resurrection from the dead now, let me begin to come down uh, to a general level. I've given you a general overview of what this thing looks like, but let's go down a little bit. What is apostolic ministry? We have to understand that. In Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, the apostles of old said, we will give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. We will give ourselves to prayer that's the place of incense, the place of intense prayer, the place of, 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 of a life without distraction, a place where you can meditate in the word of God, a place where you can have a word spoken to you from heaven, where you have a rhema word of what is going to be, what you are supposed to say, and what you are supposed to teach the people of God. And so the apostolic ministry is in Acts chapter 6, verse number 4. And the Bible says, clearly there he said we will give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the world that is apostolic ministry and you see the apostles dedicated themselves so close so completely so submissively to that intimacy with god to that uh, 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 that sounding in the bosom of God, that unity with heaven, that union with heaven, that oneness with heaven, that what heaven would do is what an apostle would do in a circumstance. That begins to show you the operation of the apostles, that when they speak, they speak from the master. When they speak, they speak from God. When they speak, they speak from heaven. And of course, they have help. They help in terms of the power of the Holy Spirit, their help 
is a myriad of angels. Their help comes from God himself. Their help is a team of men that work together with them. You never see an apostle going alone. You never see an apostle going about alone. No, you see him working with men. You see him working with people. You see him ministering with people. You hardly see Jesus alone except he goes to pray in a private place. Even when he went at one time with Peter, James, and John, he went with them in a company. And then they saw a vision on the Matthew chapter 18. And then the glory of God came down, which he told them not to reveal to anybody until his passion. And after his passion, Peter began to talk about, we saw his glory on the mount. And he said it was not something private. It was something that was manifest by heaven, manifest by the Holy Spirit. So I want you to understand Understand that God always and will always equip some people to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be pastors, some to be evangelists and teachers. So I want you to understand that God is ready to manifest himself in your life if only you are patiently following and diligently following. By diligence followership, I mean that you have a dedication, unparalleled dedication, unparalleled commitment in the place of prayer an unparalleled com commitment to the reading of the world, to the meditation in the world, because Paul told jo God told Joshua, this word of the Lord shall not depart out of your mouth. Thou shalt meditate therein day and night. And then God equated that, that that is what will bring kingdom success. Again, in Psalm 1, uh, Psalm 1, verse 1 to 3, it's a blessed is the man, you know, that, 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 that does not dwell in the place of discomfort. And so he goes on to say what blessing will follow the person that meditates in the word of God day and night. That is my paraphrase. So understand what I'm talking about here. Now, let me stay clearly here, coming down a little bit, is to say that it is easier, it is easier to receive these gifts of the Holy Spirit or to be selected or to be recognized as a man that is given by God to a local church or to a local ministry or to the body of Christ when, number one, when you have a mentor, 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 it is easy. All right, it is shorter. Your labor is shorter. And I'm talking about this from experience. All right, I'm talking about this because of what I have seen in my own life. And because of that, I have concluded that it is easier to receive the gifts of men as well as the gifts of the spirit. If you have a mentor, for instance, that is able to tell you and recognize the gift of the spirit in your life and is able to recognize the gift of God that you give to the church by the grace of God. Now, not only that, number two, it is important to also receive these things easily if the person that is your mentor already knows the way, already knows about the gifts of the spirit, already know about the gifts of men, then it will be easy for him to recognize in your life and others together in the local church what it is all about. Now, number, number three is the fact that these mentors, already have the gifts operating in their own lives. And because they have the gifts operating in their own life, they are able to tell when it is operating in the life of another way, in another man, maybe even in a different manner. And then number three is the fact that this gift up to the body of Christ can easily be picked up by the elders of the church by prophecy. Like in Acts chapter 13, when the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work that I have for them. In other words, they are going to be apostles. And as soon as they were laid hands on and fasted and prayed, the Bible says in Acts chapter 14, 14, that Paul and Barnabas, these apostles, it was there in Acts 14, 14, that they were first called apostles. So we know definitely that this is what it is about. And then number four is that it is important for us that if we will be equipping others, if the mentor is ready and is willing to equip others, then it will be easy for those that are under him to be able to follow along. There are leaders that are not willing to equip others easily. They want them to stay there, maybe because they want a large church, 
maybe because they want a large congregation. And so they probably keep them for a long time. Uh, but really, there is no, nothing minus or plus about it, depending on the circumstances of the individuals. Now, so it is important for us to state this very clearly. And going further, in Acts chapter 13, verse 1 to 3, we see an apostolic church among the Gentiles. Therefore, it must be crucial. It must be critical. Please notice my words. It must be crucial. It must be critical. The reason why we want apostles and prophets that the, the reason for apostles and prophets is that certain components, certain components must be available in order to make a church and the church of God very strong. For example, there are certain components that are necessary to form a thrust, T-H-R-U-S-T, T-H-R-U-S-T, to form a trust among the, the Gentiles. All right, without the necessary components in the church, the breakthrough will be difficult. Without the necessary components in a car, a car will not work. But when you have the right components in a car, the car will kick and begin to move. In the same way in the church, when the right components are not there and the right components are not invited to come in, in order to make that church to be strong, you find that that church will be struggling for a very long time on the, on the same spot. But ability to attract people and bring people in and a breakthrough among the Gentiles is so important for us to concentrate on as the reason why we want apostles and prophets. So it's important for us that these missing components are highly regarded. Now, let me go further by saying, number one, the reason for apostles and prophets and teachers and pastors and evangelists and uh, all these people is to penetrate among the Gentiles, among sinners, among the worldly people, to have the power, to have the wisdom, to have the interest, to have the passion, to have the compassion, to have the grace of God, to be able to walk among Gentiles. That's why it is so necessary. Number two, these gifts, these components are to perfect the church for the work of the ministry. So I've said two things in one breath, to perfect the church. That in itself is a great job because when the church is perfected, then the church can go on to do the work of the ministry. Or as the church is being perfected, then they can get engaged in the work of the ministry. Not only that, it is important to realize as well that building of the body, all right, to the stature of the fullness of Christ is very important that Jesus came for that particular purpose, that he may build this church and that the church of God will prevail against the gates of hell. A church that is not built and is not reigning in a particular city, then the enemy will try to challenge that church. I will tell you a story about Christ's church, your city, uh, in a while. Uh, because certain things happened in your city many years ago. I don't know whether it is still there today or it has been eradicated completely, but I've never been to your city. But reading certain uh, uh, journals uh, many years ago, as far back as 1998, I found out that there was uh, somebody in your city which uh, apostles and prophets from America just visited town and they dealt with in the city of Christ Church. I will come back to that later. So it's important in building the body, in building the body of Christ, that you get enthralled in the fact that you are building the body to be strong so it can confront principalities and powers over a region. Not only that, to prevent instability and backsliding in the church, it is necessary to increase the body is, is important. To extend the kingdom of God is important. Those are cogent, cogent reasons to desire the place of apostles and prophets, not just the title, but the function. Not just that, oh, I'm apostle or I'm prophet. Well, praise God for being an apostle and being a prophet, but that's not the case. The case is, are you functioning? The case is, are you manifesting? The case is, are you making manifest the grace and the gift of God that God has given you? Rather than the boast, do we have a function? Do we have results? 
All right, because the root is what bears the shoot, and it's the root that bears the branches. And therefore, when you have the grace of God stored in your life, the result will show that it's not an empty boast, but something that you are given by God. Again, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, the Bible says he gave some. He gave some, not all. He gave some to be apostles. He gave some to be prophets. He gave some to be teachers. He gave some to be uh, uh, evangelists and pastors. That's how he gave it to them. So it's a divine call. It's a divine call. God calls a man. And the church is able to recognize that call. As we see in Acts chapter 13, verse 1, the Bible says then they gather together, uh, you know, people like Prochorus, like Nicanor, and Paul, and Saul, and Barnabas, they were worshiping together, just worshiping God. And then the Holy Ghost said in verse 2, separate me, Paul, and Barnabas. So he, they were within the context of a church. They were within the context of the people of God praying and ministering together. And then this happened suddenly. And they were called and separated. Now, understand that God only does the calling. You know, my mother cannot call me. <laughs> Except my father was spiritual and were over me spiritually. He cannot give me a call. And even if he does give a call, it must be through God. God must have spoken to him to call me. You know, so I want to say that very clearly that it is God that gives this call. And make sure you have the grace to bear the trouble that goes along with the apostolic ministry. Let me also say very clearly uh, and understand that there are different forms of grace and gift within the, Christ, within the body of Christ. For instance, Peter was an apostle. Paul also was an apostle. Peter, I mean, James was an apostle. Paul also was an apostle. Timothy was also an apostle. But you will see that the apostolic grace, the dimension, the color, uh, the bent in the life of Paul and the shape and the garment in the life of Paul was different from that of Peter. Now, the Bible says very clearly that God that gave, uh, that gave Peter to be an apostle is also the one that made Paul to be an apostle. But he made Paul to be an, uh, Peter to be an apostle to the Jews, all right? And he was basically was stationed more so in Jerusalem. And those people personally, we call them doctrinal apostles. There are many doctrinal apostles around the world. Not only that. Paul was a missionary apostle. In other words, somebody that is sent to other tribes who have never heard the gospel before. And so I want you to understand that these, these gifts, they cannot be tied in a box. They cannot be tied somewhere and just tied down uh, without it being functional. It is when it is functional that the face of it can be defined. The, 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 the smell of it can be discerned. You know, the color of it can be seen clearly. And then we can define it. Oh, this is a gift that is peculiarly given to this individual. And the church gathers together, rallies around together without jealousy, even to pray on such an individual and release the individual so that the grace of God can be fulfilled in his life. So, for instance, for Paul, the apostle to plant a church among the Gentiles, he needed a team. All right, he needed a team to go together with him. Uh, and if you read the Acts of the Apostles very well, you'll see people like Prochorus, Nicanor, you'll see people like uh, 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 Titus, you'll see people like Timothy uh, in his team that they went around with him. You know, it was actually going around with Barnabas before until Acts chapter 15 when they were solely divided uh, based on John Mark, all right? And then uh, 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 Barnabas took John Mark, which eventually survived and, and uh, you know, wrote a beautiful, powerful book uh, in the Bible uh, because he was able to nurture Mark to come back and be useful. And Paul himself acknowledged the usefulness of Mark later. But then there were others that went with uh, Paul, somebody like Silas, somebody like like Titus, they went with uh, with Paul in a team. So he needed that team to go first. And so God had to en en ensure he had this Arabian experience. And then he was brought to the Antioch church by Barnabas. And there he learned about the church. Now, you can't plant a church without knowing how the church looks like. 
And so he needed to have an experience, basically. Uh, and then before he will start a church and then make it to move on. Now, secondly, understand that the final preparation for him to be released into the apostolic ministry was waged and, and formed and orchestrated in the, in, the, in the church at Antioch. This is very important because when you send out somebody as an apostle or you release somebody into apostolic ministry, he must have a backing and his final preparation should be among some elders that gather together to be able to release that individual. Not only that, God called all right, was confirmed by these elders. Because as they prayed and ministered to the Lord, the Bible said, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Saul and Barnabas, or Barnabas and Saul, for the work that I have for them. So they are called and their definition of what they were to do was defined and confirmed by the elders of this church. Next, understand that God's training all right, of Paul, all right, was very, very peculiar because Paul himself had to make reference to all these experiences he had in the time past. And so God's timing became important for him. And so at the right time, the Holy Ghost said it should be separated and released, which is very, very important. And then furthermore, Paul's apostolic, uh, you know, uh, in Antioch, Okay, his team came together in Antioch. As Barnabas joined together with him, they have Paul, uh, I mean, they have Mark, John Mark, as, they sat, as, his, as one who will serve with them. And later on, people like Timothy in Acts chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, were added to the team as they went further. Not only that, he received spiritual covering in this church of Antioch. This point should be noted because an apostle is not just a lonely person going about without some responsibility to some other people. And so prayers and fasting were held for this man before they ever were launched, both Barnabas and Saul. Not only that, God made sure that in order to have missionaries among the Gentiles, this team were called to go forth. So the first missionary team among the Gentiles were released to go forward. Not only that, and finally on this matter, we make sure, brothers and sisters, that Paul found it, and that church at Antioch was where he came back to as his base. So you find that's why I call that uh, Antioch church as an apostolic church. It became an apostolic base. So when you start a work somewhere, you can have an apostolic base in a particular place. For example, our ministry, Full Statue Missions International, we have an apostolic base in Ibado City, Nigeria. Now, uh, why do I say that? Because it is from this base church that we decided we are not just going to put, 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 multiply churches all over Nigeria because we were focused and called to go to people who have never had the gospel before. People who have had minimally, maybe about 5% of the tribe or 2% of the tribe that we enter have ever had the name Jesus. And so we were sent to them to bring them out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so what we did was to start a school in 1994. And when we started the school, we equipped the people. And after equipping, we sent the first batch to Ghana. The next batch was sent to Togo. And the next batch was sent to a, tri a Muslim tribe in Guinea-Bissau in 1996. And those missionaries are still there today, and God is helping them mightily. I want to say something that 30 years ago, when we started Full Statue Missions International, as an apostolic ministry, God helped us. And today, we have been able to reach at least 40 tribes where the gospel has never been preached before. Of course, it's not just preaching we we'll, we'll go there to do. Uh, that's why I'm not emphasizing, because there's no time for that, about signs, wonders, and miracles, and things like that. That helped us to penetrate in those uh, Gentile lands, in those lands uh, that um, you know nobody had ever preached. When they see signs and wonders, it's easier for them to get saved rather than people within the city who have had the gospel for 100 years or 200 years, and then they need miracle after miracle to prove to them that you have actually come to share with them the gospel. And so I want to say to you that that is our own experience, and we're just building it into the message 
to show and to illustrate the point that is being made. Now, let's go, let's boil down a little bit for, for that before we close down. Number, number, number three or number four of the matter is that the apostolic type personalities must be recognized. There are apostolic type personalities that leaders in the local church should recognize. You should put eyes on the ground to recognize certain people that have apostolic type personality. What do I mean by that? Number one, all right, you find a person who can initiate new things and not just remain a maintenance figure, right? You know, if you give a lady, um, you know, three children to keep in the, in the Sunday school, the children's Sunday school, well, at the end of the service, you meet the three children because women are very, very diligent. I'm not saying women cannot be apostles, but the fact of the matter is that they maintain things better than men. And so I'm not talking about the maintenance ministry whereby you stay in one spot to maintain a particular group, although that can be an apostolic church too, but nevertheless, it goes beyond that. An apostolic personality is able, by the grace of God, to initiate new things and not just maintenance. Number two, you can these people, when you know them, they focus on seeing things change. They can't tolerate things remaining the same over and over again. They want things to change. They want things to change. They want things to change from glory to glory, from faith to faith, all right, from strength to strength. That's the nature of an apostolic person. Number three, they are ready to invest in in a blazing trail, all right? They are ready to invest in a blazing trail and for others to follow. <laughs> they don't just want to be followers. They want to be invest their, they want to invest their life in, a, in, a, in, a, in something that is a blazing trail. And so that's important. The next, number four, is that they embrace risks, all right? Faith, F-A-I-T-H, is spelled R-I-S-K. Faith is spelled risk, and an apostolic person is a risk taker. Although to us it is risk, but to God that is his world. To God that is his comfort zone. For us, that is not our comfort zone. For an apostolic person, he likes risk. He likes all kinds of uh, extraordinary uh, going around and exploration, let me say. You know, for example, I studied geology in university. And, uh, you know, our, our in thing is to go about uh, looking for rocks, looking for sediments, looking for granites, looking for oil, looking for minerals, looking for those things like that. So we don't sleep in the house. We carry our, our hammer. We carry our directional equipment. We carry our geophysical equipment in order to trail water or to trail some other mineral. And we do all those kind of things to search and we're exploring from village to village, from city to city. We're always going around drawing a map for a nation in order to find their wealth. And so that kind of entrepreneurial spirit is there in the apostolic person. And when we see them, we must respect them because in a local church, that can sometimes become disruptive if the father in the house does not know how to mentor and manage such individuals. And I pray that God himself will speak to us as I speak to you now by the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. I remember a young man many, many years ago. I don't want to mention his name. He was such a virile person. Each time he came to church, I saw this man will always sit at the door. Just immediately we say, amen, he's gone. You know, and he's such a quick person, the way he walks, he's a quick walker. He walks quick, he eats quick, and you can't find him loafing around. He's always asking questions for the next step and next step. Uh, Daddy, what are we going next about this one, about that one? And so I recognize this guy is unsettled. He wants to go and plant churches, preach the gospel, be an evangelist, and just run riot in the camp of the devil. And so when I saw that, I think I sent him to Bumosho, one of our big cities, at that time. And then he went there and he really, he had exploits by the grace of God. So you can recognize those people that have this kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 attitude of, of, of being up and going, always wanting to go and go and go. Now, not only that, they ask for extraordinary breakthroughs. 
That's an apostolic person for you. And that's the manifestation. That is the operation of an apostolic person. They ask for dangerous breakthroughs. A person like uh, the men of David who would who would who will hold together and get water behind the enemy lines. That's extraordinary. A man like David who would take a stone and face Goliath, who had been harassing all of Israel for 42 days. So you can imagine that. Those are extraordinary things. A man like Paul, who will be stoned in Areopagus, that's the temple, and then he will beckon his hand and speak in Greek and speak in Hebrew and tell the people to be silent, even though bleeding, even though being persecuted, yet he's able to spread his hand and say, wait, my brethren, this is the message I brought. The beating, the persecution, did not, he did not lose his focus. He did not lose his mind as to what he was pursuing. And that is an apostolic type person. Not only that, they don't look back. Once they start, they are focused in going forward. They are focused in going to the front and not any other thing. Not only that, they, 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 they set people apart. When people like that are set apart, all right, they generally, in, from the local assembly, they allow them to build an apostolic team. And then from then, they begin to go forward into the nations. That's the last thing I want to mention about them. After making sure they're recognized and prayed for, we release them to go. Last Sunday, we released a couple to go to Sierra Leone, even though they are not directly working under the full Statue Missions International. But we hold missionary conferences every year in which we mobilize the church from all over the world to be able to do missionary activity, apostolic outreaches uh, to places around the world. And this guy gave his life, and his, he and his family and two children, you know, last uh, a Sunday and said, we want to go forward. Since August, he gave his life and he's been mentored from that time. And then by this uh, March, last Sunday, or April, last Sunday, he came forward and we laid hands on him, prophesied on him, and then sent him forth to go to the nations. Now, let me come back. You know, I have a book here, uh, which uh, I wrote in 1998, uh, this is a book I wrote in 1998 concerning these issues of how and what the, the apostle will build in your life. How do you recognize him as a member of the church? And how does the apostle also recognize other apostles and other ministers, other prophets, other uh, pastors and evangelists and teachers? How does he recognize them? I wrote this book, and that is uh, Walking in God's Reign in 1998. It was reprinted in, in 2019 uh, because you find a lot of people use it in their Bible schools in this place. So I want to say to you that it is an intense time for us to be able to talk together about this matter. On page uh, 86 of this book, I wrote a story there that I want to read to you. The witch in Christ Church, New Zealand. In Christ Church, the, New Zealand, there was a man called the wizard who was coming to the cathedral square every day at the same time to claim the city for Satan and preach his evil messages. He had become a national celebrity and was even, uh, even shown, uh, you know, and the man had even shown on, on promotional films distributed by the Ministry of Tourism in the place. And when Francis Frangipain and, um, and a man called uh, Rick Joyner came to Christ Church uh, some years at that time, I think 1997 or 1998, they were ministering at a conference there, and they saw they went to the square to claim the city for the Lord, knowing that the witch man also was coming there. And so seeing the evil in the square and being provoked, they marched around that, that square and asked the Lord to send light to that square and to cast out darkness. And later, I challenge, he challenged the spiritual leadership of that city that they did not have to put up with that wizard. But whatever they lose in heaven will be loose in the earth. And whatever they bound on the earth shall be bound in heaven. So the next day, a group of these elders went to the square at the time that the wizard was to appear. And it could not come that day because the Bibles, I mean, the, the news said that he was either sick or he wasn't able to come. So the Christians began to pray. 
But he sent another message through another man. As they prayed quietly and stood together to pray, the wizard's emissary became so confused that he could no longer read the message that was given to him. Finally, he departed, declaring that he had lost his voice. This was a great encouragement to the elders of the city of Christ church at that time. And this particularly steered many of them to rise up against the darkness overcoming their city. This wizard had been confirmed by, by Christians many times, and they would usually get into a shouting match, which the wizard will win anyway. And at the least, once the Christians got into a fist fight, among themselves. So you can see how it is not good to fight the devil with no natural hands. And when combating evil powers, we cannot overcome evil with evil. So Satan cannot cast out Satan. Jesus said, if I cast out demons, he says, if I cast out demons, uh, it, 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 it is by the power of God. And so it, this story that I wanted to read to you, that many years ago, this actually happened in your city, Christ Church, that a prophet and an apostle came to town and they were able to silence, at least for some time, uh, a witch at the Cathedral Square of Christ Church. I don't know the place myself, but I just wrote, I, I read this in his, in a rejoinance magazine and took permission to publish it and include it in my book. And so what I'm saying basically is this, that we have opportunity today to see that we can overcome the works of darkness and be totally free from the devil, to, to, to be totally free and set other people free. It is this power that God gives us that we can really manifest this grace of God. Remember going to Ghana one time and their currency was down. Everything in the nation was down. Now, I knew many people, many other people prayed, but at that time, God just anointed me. We were having a prayer meeting with some Ghanaians, and I said they should bring out the Ghanaian CD, and they brought out the Ghanaian CD. I said, put it under your feet, and then we began to prophesy that very soon the Ghanaian CD will be equal to the, to the American dollar. And you will not believe within a period of two years that change and the president cut away all the zeros behind their 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 their, 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 their currency and at that time a dollar was equal to the city now the economy again had gone down and now a dollar is like 12 ghana cities or 13 or 14 ghana cities as i'm talking now but it is the power of god and prayer that can bring that to pass I remember going to ghana at least at another time and they took me to a place uh, which was a horrendous place a natural harbor where the slave trade first began in africa and they took me there to see the instruments of cruelty that the slave traders from portugal and from everywhere they used in uh, marking the body of africans as they transported them across the ocean and they showed me all those things. I wept so, my brothers and sisters. I wept and wept and wept because I still saw the instruments, the firewood, the, uh, the blacksmith that mended and made those instruments of, 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 of cruelty. And then as I wept and wept, we went to the house of the canon that invited me and we continued prayer there. And then prophecy broke out. And I began to prophesy that this particular place where the, the slaves have been taken away, in this place riches also shall come to the nation of ghana and oil shall be found in this place and oil i mean no petroleum oil and oil shall be dug from this place within a period of four years and i just said that i didn't know how and why i said it but i tell you within three years oil was found in that place today ghana is a an oil exporting country so what can cause that it is because god is interested in that country and he sends a man to bear something that had not been born before it was after the oil came that people came and told me and they said well they have explored for oil in that region many many years and many many times and they could not strike any oil but after that prophetic apostolic visit god gave them oil in that place what can I say to you about other nations that God had used our brethren even to pass and, and make a way where there was no way? For example, let me finally close with this. Uh, there was uh, a northern part, a northeastern part of Ghana, 
where there have always been warfare, intra-tribal wars, and they fought that every year. They would send soldiers there every year. Nobody could start the, stop the war. But when we entered that northeastern part of Ghana to reach the Konkomans, a tribe called the Konkomans, you know, they were a warlike tribe. And we went there. I personally went there, and we began to survey the place. And we find out that they were fighting against other tribes. Now, in this particular location, one of our mission, the leader in Ghana, at that I mean, right now, I went to that place and they could not reach out to particular areas. But a particular woman got saved. And then they he now invited them to come and talk to her husband. This husband was the ceremonial uh, uh, cultist and the chief power man in the area that made fetish as well as bulletproof for the people. In Africa, we understand what I'm talking about. When they shoot a bullet at you, the bullet will not penetrate because you are wearing a bulletproof uh, medicine or you are wearing a bu bulletproof a cultic material. And so you will not be penetrated by the power uh, or, or a, a, a gun uh, that is shot at you. And so this man was giving such powers to people and they continued that attitude of war. But the day our missionary visited him, he drove them away immediately because the wife had gone to his house to pray and his, his paraphernalia were no longer and the phenomena were no longer happening. And so he, he discovered it was his wife. But the wife eventually managed to be uh, to be tempered, was patient, and then eventually the missionaries to visit their house. This time, the man chased them away. But as they were going, just about 50 meters from the house, the Lord said, go back and pray for him. And so they went back. And they said, man, can we pray for you? And they said, yes, we can pray for you. And we, you can pray for me. Uh, and then they saw, yeah, they saw uh, an ulcer on his leg, which has never many, many years. And so they offered to pray for the ulcer, which himself, the medicine man, could not kill. His phenomena around darkness could not solve the, the, the feet were healed in the dry dog, and we could no longer be found. That's how the man repented. So all the young people who are going to war no longer found any phenomenal or juju or a medicine or any amulet to take to battle. That is how the problem in that community and that region was solved. So soldiers are no longer being sent there today because the gospel are taking over and light has entered in the midst of darkness because there was a group of brethren that reached their life to go face the principality and power in the land. I pray as you hear me right now, you will tap into the anointing that is flowing. You will tap into the anointing that is going on. I'm going to pray for an apostle. I'm going to pray for a prophet. I'm going to pray for a teacher. I'm going to pray for evangelists and pastors from among you. I'm going to pray for businessmen among you that God will raise some people who will be able to mentor others and then you have extraordinary breakthrough in Christ land, in, Christ, in New Zealand. I believe this will happen to you in the name of Jesus. Rasa shapali kandere babudi, hallelujah. And broke a vanto lamo sota kalabarata. And broke a vanto dom savalika tarapa. And broke a vanto labie to napasule karapa. And the league upon the Lebobude, hallelujah. I am the suja found the Lebarike Tanda, every Joseph among you. I command in the name of Jesus that your business will begin to turn another side. You begin to turn positively. You begin to receive wisdom and dreams from above. I ran the tomboli, command the soda prabicala bosa, all the tombs that are among you, all the tomoses that are among you. I pray for you right now that you carry an anointing of power. You carry an anointing to heal the sick. You carry an anointing to raise the dead. And broke a vanta libro for Katandele Bobude. They saw a woman there who had been tied down. Your faith had been tied down and unable to grow. The Lord sets you free right now. The Lord sets you free right, right now. In the name of Jesus. This day and hour, the Lord sets you free today. He sets you free today to be able to manifest the grace of God in your life. 
I remember one time I was in one redeemed church in Lagos, and I recognized during the teaching and the classes, they didn't have teachers. And so I called the attention of the pastor and the resident pastor there. I said, you doesn't look, you don't have teachers here. And he said, yes, you don't have teachers. So when he came to the night vigil, a particular time came around 2, 2 a.m. And I took a permission from me. I said, can I pray for your people? that God will raise teachers for you in this local church. And he said, yes, sir. And so I, they gather everybody. We began to pray. We began to pray. We began to pray. And I began to call for the anointing of teacher, of a teacher to rest on the people. And every many people, at least 20 of them, began to cry. They began to shed tears and fall on the ground without anybody laying hands on them because the anointing of a teacher had come upon them from that day. And they began to teach the Sunday school. They began to teach in the church. I believe there are some of you that God wants to anoint as an apostle, as a pastor, as a teacher, as a prophet, as an evangelist. Receive in the name of Jesus. I pray that if there is any sickness on your body that you are healed now in the name of Jesus from your crown of your head to the sole of your feet. I command that you be healed right now. I feel the anointing where I'm sitting down. I feel the anointing from the crown of my head to the soul of my feet, that the angels are walking on the other side, that the angels of God are walking on the other side, and as you know, there is no distance between here and Christ Church. Even though we have 12 hours separation, yet I broke a vandal of Abude, hallelujah. God has broken the yoke, and the release of the kingdom can be in this church, in this beautiful place. Around the cap the Babude, and even your narrow place shall soon enlarge and break a thunder la very catasa. For there shall be a thunder from heaven, a miracle from heaven that had never been seen before. Yalato le moje kalibana higher, and children and elders and youth shall see it, and they shall come forth in the grace of God. Receive grace now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. I know that I've exceeded my time by a few minutes that I started, but I know I, I'm still within my one hour. I pray for you that the Lord will continually bless your church. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, I prayed. And everyone said, Amen. And everyone said, Amen. And everyone said, Amen. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you. Blessed be the name of God. And you want to be shaped with your word. Oh, my God. Father, we give you praise. Father, we give you praise. Thank you very much, sir. We really appreciate you, sir. Thank you very much, sir.